Welcome to Going Underground with me, Afshin Ratansi. Three times a week, we're bringing you the stories that really matter in the United Kingdom, ones you won't find covered by the mainstream media. In today's show, protest, what protest? How the British media seem to miss what happened on London's streets on the 5th of November. Plus, policing the police, is there really such a thing as reasonable force when it comes to dealing with protesters? And as it's Remembrance Sunday tomorrow, we look at the red poppy versus white poppy debate. For these stories and more, let's go underground. If you weren't at the Million Mask March on the 5th of November, you might not even know it happened. Associated with the hacktivist movement Anonymous, millions of people in nearly 500 cities worldwide, including thousands of people across the UK, took part in demonstrations against cuts, corruption and state surveillance. Union members and many others also marched in protest at austerity measures. But the corporate media in the UK didn't think any of this warranted much coverage. Even the arrest of 15 people involved in clashes with the police near Buckingham Palace didn't seem to merit a headline on news channels. With me is RT's very own Sarah Firth. Welcome to Going Underground, Sarah. No other uh, media thought it should merit a headline. Why did you think it was an important story? Ashing, call me old-fashioned, but when there are thousands of people marching to the Houses of Parliament right outside the front, people then marching on Buckingham Palace with some very vocal points that they wanted to make. I think that, as a reporter, that's exactly what you should be doing. It's a story that you've got to cover. And actually, it can't be ignored. You know, you've got social media uh, putting it out there. So traditional forms of media really have to keep up, and that's why we were there covering it every step of the way. Did it surprise you it wasn't on the main broadcasters, the state-mandated BBC or ITV? There was no headline about it. It's not a D notice. You don't think there's some conspiracy or they just weren't interested in fireworks at Buckingham Palace? I think it's really difficult because the fact that there was no media coverage as this was going on does of course fuel those you know conspiracy theories that this media blackouts all pre-planned but I, I think it's unfortunate that the mainstream media uh, is really getting a reputation for ignoring events of this kind. This isn't the first time that they've done it. A lot of the people who were turning out uh, to join in this march, we're expecting it. Uh, and I think it's really, really sad that uh, unfortunately many of the media outlets did live up to that expectation and just weren't there. Um, very surprising, I think, for me being there with our RT cameramen. I mean, it was just this amazing picture, these you know amazing messages. It was such a big I saw story. them tweeting, people were tweeting yeah, at you. Yeah, 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 everyone was getting very engaged in it and it was you know a very fast developing story as you saw from the pictures. Um, a lot was changing, they moved from Trafalgar Square, they moved on to uh, Parliament Square and then of course we had that unexpected twist where they <laughs> took to the streets of London and went to Buckingham Palace. They took this fight to the steps, to the doorsteps of our government leaders. The press did, in fairness, start to cover it many hours later. I don't know whether some of your footage ended up on some mainstream broadcasters because they didn't have anyone there. But they sent it on Russell Brand, on a celebrity being there, rather than the issues of why these people were protesting. Yeah, and I think, you know what, that shows, I think, a real snobbery that when a story's happening, you make that editorial decision about what's important, what's not important. You know, this is a news event when thousands of people turn out onto the streets uh, in that sort of protest movement you've got to report it i mean you can't ignore that happening and so yeah i think it's it's really surprising very disappointing um that that it wasn't covered and didn't get the coverage it deserved and these actions took place in nearly 500 cities around the world corporate media in america was covering the dc and la protests do you think it's odd that the uh, guy fawkes mask from v for vendetta it's all about the British Parliament and Britain. Yeah, I mean, that's what's so crazy because, of course, the anonymous masters is taking place around the world. And this is, you know, a British tradition. I don't Parliament? Think, yeah, I don't yeah. think around the world people know who Guy Fawkes is, do they, really? That's become the anonymous emblem. But, you know, he, that was our tradition. And so you'd have thought that we would be at the very centre of that coverage, saying, you know, it's bonfire night and Guy Fawkes is still a symbol of political mischief. It's now gone global. And, uh, yeah, that, that just didn't happen. There were many, many police vans all over Parliament Square, up by the Mall. What did you think of the police tactics used on the demonstration? 
it, it was strange the way that it was handled, I think, for me, watching the way that it developed. Um, I definitely got the sense that the police maybe weren't prepared for the march onto Buckingham Palace. Um, and it they hadn't seen the film. <laughs> they hadn't. They wouldn't have been prepared for the blowing up of Parliament. Well, then, no, they, they didn't they think wouldn't. they'd go to the Queen. But you make a very serious point. I mean, if things had developed, it, it, it could have taken a turn for the worse. And I don't. I think what we saw was a slightly chaotic, heavy-handed approach, rather than what could have been a much more organised, moderate approach. So there were, you know, a lot of police around, a very heavy police presence. Um, but on Parliament Square, we saw things developing very quickly. And then you sort of have the police jumping in, and there's a lot of pushing and shoving. The tension, like, changes in a second. You know, everyone gets very hot under the collar. Um, the police are suffering cuts themselves. Well, you think they identify and the with the anonymous people. the protesters were saying that to people. them. You know, the protesters were saying to them, you're, you know, you're suffering as much as us. Um, but, I, you know, the, the sort of engagement, the way they engage with protesters, it, you know, unnecessary tensions were created, I think, and we, you know, we saw that, we were with the protesters. But we did get a little bit uh, too up close and personal with the Metropolitan Police at moments of it. Um, that's because it, it, it does sort of change very quickly, the mood amongst the protesters when the police are seen to be acting in a heavy-handed way, but when you're shoving the protesters in that manner, of course, it is going to just flare tempers and uh, that's definitely what we saw. As we saw from the footage. Yeah, I mean, my, my cameraman was absolutely amazing, but she was sort of being dragged left, right and centre and we were sort of trying to film a piece to camera as people were being shoved. At, at one point I got someone get me by the back of the collar and drag me off, obviously not realising I was press. Archie's Sarah Furt, thank you for coming on Going Underground. Thank you for having me, Ashin. The current law here in the UK states that police are allowed to use reasonable force when it's necessary. But what does that actually mean in practice? Four police officers currently face prosecution after a mentally ill prisoner, Thomas Orchard, died in custody when officers tied a restraining belt across his mouth. In fact, over 800 people have died during or following encounters with the police since 2004. All cases are investigated by the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Not one officer has so far been convicted. With me is Charlie Veach of the Love Police. Charlie, welcome to Going Underground. You're uh, in trouble with the police, or at least you have been. What is reasonable force? Because uh, it's been applied to you. Only reasonable force. Well, well reasonable yeah, reasonable force. force is a very open and vague concept which the police can use to prevent themselves being sued, either through a criminal or a civil case. So when they get an activist, for example, um, a guy called Archie during the student riots, he very violently headbutted the police truncheon about five times and because it was his head attacking the police truncheon which gave him a, a kind of concussion damaging taxpayers brain. money yeah property. yeah so basically the police by holding their truncheon peacefully and him headbutting it they used reasonable force there they send him away for a while they he had to go for brain surgery that very night to save his life because he had bleeding on the brain so it's reasonable how did you see the media coverage of that at the time because uh, that certainly uh, the first time one saw that case uh, the right-wing well, press were pretty quick, I would th assume, to say. Well, yeah, the, the police are right. As we saw with the London and Manchester riots, the one after the Mark Duggan shooting, and also the student riots, the the kind of the establishment press, Daily Telegraph, Daily Mail, Daily Express, the BBC, obviously conveyed a picture that these were drunken, stupid, criminal yobbos wanting to cause wanton, nihilistic destruction. But the corporate media quick to paint that case and other cases as uh, the police trying their best to control the, the, the mob. Well, what happens, Ashin, those with a monopoly on violence and uh, on force, as in the state, the military, the police, will always denounce the small peasant who thinks that maybe I can also use force or I can show my displeasure by attacking a police van or a government building as we saw during the student riots and so you need a perspective that is outside the establishment to sometimes tell the truth about what's happening because when we you know the west the, not we but the west will support these hyper islamist terrorists in syria attacking the government and they're freedom fighters and rebels but when you get many levels of less intensity of a student who is very upset that his uh, Lib Dem leader, Nick Clegg, said no tuition fees, <laughs> and all of a sudden he has to pay £9,000 per year 
30,000 pounds over a degree. And he goes and smashes up a bus stop, which isn't like bombing a Syrian government building, but they get painted as the most nasty low life. There's a slight a swiff of eugenics about the kind of press saying that the poor are responsible for their own poverty. It's a very clever way to kind of keep the establishment established and keep smashing down the poor. But what about this police viciousness? I mean, I think I remember Jean Genet talking about the 68 Vietnam demos and saying there's something curious here because the police ranks are from the poor and they're the ones beating these people up. Some very clever Roman, who I can't remember his name, said you can always pay half the poor to kill the other half because they want money. There's the unenlightened poor. Police viciousness, one of my big issues that I've been telling many people like You've yourself, been hit personally. I've been hit personally. I've been trunching. And handcuffed pretty badly. Handcuffed and very tightly. The police, God bless their little angry souls, have to deal with drug addicts and junkies and rapists and murderers. So then those people are dirty, but when they go to a protest when there's a bunch of, you know, dreadlocked, clean, middle-class kids with a social conscience, they can release all their anger and hatred and start smashing up these people who their only crime is for speaking out against what they, they see as wrong. And so, the, and that's being used very effectively in the times of austerity, presumably. And we'll see more of that? Well, we, see, we saw it in the 80s, didn't we, with the miners and how the police quite happily they might be in the same boat, they might come from the same kind of socioeconomic background, but they'll happily smash up because the police are very well indoctrinated. They wear the big queen's crown. They have to swear allegiance. They have to swear an oath to the queen. So their job is to earn their 30,000 pounds a year and a fantastic pension to maintain order and to uphold the queen. They're paid to not think. Their salary depends on them not being able to see the bigger picture. Albeit that we have seen plebgate and some kind of rumblings against the government. Yeah. And the Tories, uh, I don't think Cameron's people are that fond of the Metropolitan Police at the moment. Again, or is it you're saying they just protect the Queen and Prince Charles? Well, the thing, there's, there's the establishment, which might contain the Conservatives and the Labour, but then there's the permanent establishment, which is very old money, the Windsors, the Duke of Lancaster, the Duke of Westminster, the Dukes, the ladies. That's the real establishment which the police work for. They don't swear allegiance to the government of the day, they swear allegiance to the Queen. How do you see regulation working when we hear more cases of Mark Duggan uh, yeah. and others? Well, anyone who's come up against paperwork Not that we're prejudging the Mark Duggan one, that's ongoing. Oh, yeah, the one that we can't comment, the because you know, it's an ongoing thing, of course. But the IPCC is made up mostly of ex-policemen, and we, we all know that institutionalization can, can get people into a culture. The word cult comes from culture. There is a police culture, and they'll always look after their own. And when you've been indoctrinated in the system for 25 years as a policeman, and then suddenly you're meant to snitch and rat on your fellow cops, you're not going to do that good a job. They will twist it as much as they will go within the book of the law to kind of say that everything. Well, you reasonable. say we all know, but the Supreme, Supreme Court presumably sees through that, thinks it's okay. The Attorney General, whole levels of parts of British government would say they don't know that, and the IPCC, yeah. you know, is, is a good institution. I'm glad you raised that. I think people in Britain get very distracted by the infighting at the kind of middle echelons of political power, Labour versus Conservative, the courts, you know, changing this ruling or appeals here, the police complaints. Whereas in fact, you can tell who's in charge by who you're not allowed to criticize. I want to see some mainstream outlets criticizing the Queen, criticizing Prince Philip, criticizing the Nazi connections in the past, and criticizing the fact that we send young... I'll never get my knighthood now. No, I know, sorry. Anyway, and we yeah. send my favorite Nazi irony. connections in the past. That's, in the That's past. like the Daily Mail thing. You're being yeah, as bad as yeah, the mail yeah, was to Miliband. Exactly, like I wear a Hugo Boss watch. Who cares that he designed the, the, um, you know, the SS uniform? He's a, I mean, much more seriously, deaths in custody, these statistics, no prosecution of one police officer. Within the rule of law, when, you, when they do a kind of an inquiry into a death in custody, there's always footage of some terrified prisoner who's innocent until proven guilty. So he's still an innocent man. It's mostly men that get killed. And he might be kicking off, understandably, because he's been held in captivity and he's an innocent man. And so for kicking off and complaining, the police will strangle him or like put their knees on his neck. And because he might then still be struggling, saying, get off me, get off me, they can then say it's reasonable force. You know, these are like government sanctioned restraining techniques. Charlie Veach, thank you for going underground. Thank you, Ashton.
Every four years, when election campaign time rolls around, parties are full of pledges and promises to their voters. Manifestos lay out their plans for a greater, stronger Britain. But as often as not, once the party finds itself in power, those pledges fall by the wayside. As David Cameron dithers over green taxes, we thought it was a good time to count down our favorite policy U-turns. At number six, David Cameron told Jeremy Paxman in an interview that he would not be raising VAT as his main concern was to control spending rather than increase tax. Soon after, the emergency budget raised VAT from 17.5% to an all-time high of 20%. At number five, we're still with David Cameron, but this time it's child benefit. After pledging not to change child benefit, not to means test it or alter it in any way, the new prime minister forgot about his pledge and scrapped child benefit for those he thought earned too much. At number four, Margaret Thatcher abolished the free milk for school children policy, gaining the name the Milk Snatcher. Under Cameron's government, the same plan was proposed, but comparisons to Thatcher led to Downing Street retracting the plan. Sadly for Cameron, at exactly the same time, just down the road, his colleague David Willits was telling the BBC's Andrew Marr what a great idea it was to scrap free milk for even more children. At number three, let's give David Cameron a break, poor guy. Next up is Ted Heath. He famously U-turned in a big way in the 1970s on economic policy, increasing public expenditure on healthcare, welfare, and education, and supporting nationalization. At number two, back to the coalition, but this time it's Nick Clegg and the free schools. He's recently distanced himself from the free school policy favored by the coalition, allegedly to the surprise of senior Tories. His U-turn is rumored to have led to a rift in the ruling coalition. Not that this is the only time Clegg has U-turned on policy. When the coalition came into power and Clegg failed to live up to his Lib Dem promises, he famously apologized in a speech that went viral when it was set to music. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. And at number one, who else but Tony Blair, the former Labour leader who said he had no reverse gear, promised to hold a referendum for the UK to join the Euro, but it never happened. He also famously went back on Labour's pledge not to raise income tax. In some interviews, the former PM went as far as saying he hoped to cut them. But of course, rates went up as the party realized it had gotten the whole UK economy into a mess. But many see Blair's biggest U-turn as the Iraq war. After coming to power pledging an ethical foreign policy, many still question the ethics of Britain's involvement in that military conflict. It's Remembrance Sunday tomorrow and you'll see people all over Britain wearing poppies. The vast majority of these are red, a fundraising drive by the Royal British Legion to support current and ex-servicemen and women and their families. But you might also notice a few white ones. These are the poppies of the Peace Pledge Union and they represent peace. They're not as well known as the red poppy and they're seen by some as a controversial alternative. Joining me now is Albert Beale from the Peace Pledge Union, the white poppy people, as it were. Albert, what is the white poppy? Millions of people tomorrow will be wearing the red one. They probably won't have seen this. Well, white poppy has been going actually since the 1930s. It's been used as an alternative symbol of remembrance, as a way of saying that if you really regret the deaths and the misery of warfare and you want to be consistent about it, you have to not just say, wasn't it awful, but you have to renounce and reject all future wars. One of the problems with the orthodox remembrance ceremonies, obviously, is that I don't mean every individual person involved, but when you look at the military top brass and the politicians on Remembrance Sunday, you see it on the television, they march around in Whitehall looking mournful, isn't it awful, all these dreadful things happen. On Monday morning, they're back in their office planning the next war. And to me, as a pacifist who renounces war altogether under all circumstances, that's absolutely hypocritical. So you have to be a pacifist to wear one? No, no, no. You're for people who would have allowed the Nazis to invade no, well, country after country? Two points. Firstly, no, not everybody who wears a white poppy is a pacifist. I mean, many people, the critique we have as pacifists of remembrance is something which resonates with lots of people who are other non-pacifist peace campaigners and even non-peace campaigners at all, who feel very uncomfortable with the way the red poppy is used in such a jingoistic way. In terms of my pacifism, um, I 
I'm, I'm quite a militant pacifist. I, I, I resist oppression and warfare wherever I find it. And that doesn't mean that I let people walk all over me. On the contrary, being a pacifist means resisting oppression wherever you find it. It just means you don't have mass slaughter in the process. Okay, but then you wouldn't, soldiers can't wear them then. If you're, but as you said, you don't ex, have to be a pacifist ex, to wear one. Many ex-soldiers, I mean, uh, some of my colleagues around the peace movement in groups like Veterans for Peace, they wear white poppies and they're ex-soldiers. And they, if you like, from my point of view, have seen the light. Why do you think millions of people haven't heard and won't have heard of the white poppy? Our <coughs> viewers won't have heard of this, maybe. I'm sure most people won't have. Well, one of the things is that we have a society which does... The, the basic structures of our society, the basic principles on which the power structures in our society, and indeed other, most other societies around the world operate, is that the, the use of mass organized armed force is ultimately acceptable. That is a majority view. There is a minority view which I hold, which is that it is never acceptable. But the problem is that, as we know, the media in, in most countries ta take the establishment line. They are, I mean, most people who work in the media, they are people who are well-to-do and comfortable and, and all the rest of it, people who control the media even more so. But it clearly is the case that, that the, you know, that the media in a country reflect the mainstream of the country. That's inevitable. But, I mean, even, but even Americans, American friends of mine are surprised about the red poppy thing. Because well, they say, it's not don't you have a veterans uh, well, of course it's a different, it's department a different. to give out aid? Because the red poppy people give aftercare to veterans. Okay. You don't, do you? No, I mean, the point is that in, in the States, for instance, there is a very different political culture. I mean, the, the, the meaning of military symbolism and anti-military symbolism is very different there. I mean, you know, that, that's different. Red poppies don't have the resonance. They do in some countries like Canada and New Zealand and so on, but primarily it is a very British thing. In terms of the money, I mean, every, I mean, I guess the PPU is going to be getting through about 70,000 white poppies maybe this year, something like that. If every single penny from every one of those white poppies put together, it wouldn't even pay half the wages of one of the high-paid execs of the British Legion who push out the red poppies. They've got questions to answer on, on, on finances. We don't. Yeah, but uh, anyone out there thinking of buying a white poppy, faced with uh, information and news about uh, British veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq who are disabled, who the government has turned their back on, will be thinking the way to help our brave soldiers is pay the red poppy fee? Well, <clears throat> I have to say that, it, that we live in a civilised, allegedly civilised country. We live in a country which in world terms is, is, is pretty rich country. The idea that anybody who needs help, anybody who's invalided or disabled or bereaved who needs help, doesn't get it as a matter of course from the public services that we should have in this country. I mean, that's outrageous. You shouldn't have to rattle a tin in order to, to raise money. Uh, wh whoever it is, whether a soldier or anybody else, anybody who needs help shouldn't need to rattle a tin. I mean, I look forward to the day when, when the, the the money the bankers have taken from us in recent years is all spent on, on the health service and somebody's out in the street rattling a tin to buy a new battleship. Now that's what I want to see. But uh, maybe viewers will agree with you, but then think, how on earth is it so pervasive that everyone thinks, no, if you've been injured in Iraq or Afghanistan, you come back to Britain, it's not the state, it should be people buying red poppies that pay for the aftercare. Well, it and it makes you feel good by buying well, the red poppy that you're remembering. Them. Of course helping people makes you feel good. That's one reason why I think people are naturally altruistic. But we have to realise that may, maybe it's just a, it's a function of the way power structures work in all countries. That to rise to the top of, of a regime in any country, you have to be a certain sort of person. Maybe the nice people don't get to the top. Maybe that's the, the nature of the world we live in. That, maybe that's why trying to have a peaceful and happy and contented world is an ongoing struggle. It's okay, but so the red poppy money does go for the aftercare. Where so does the white poppy money go? The white go? poppy money goes simply to producing, promoting, distributing the white poppy. It goes to producing the literature which we use to try and undermine the causes of war and to denounce war and try to stop wars. I mean, every penny that the people... I mean, the PPU is a loss-making organisation, as with most small campaigning groups. You know, nobody's making a lot of money. Most of it's voluntary, the work at the PPU. And every penny we've got goes to trying to stop, stop the misery which is causing the soldiers to be injured. Albert Beale, thank you for going You're very underground. Thirteen percent of 20 to 24 year olds are currently out of work. If you're one of them stuck at home applying for one of the few jobs out there facing rejection after rejection, maybe it's your parents' fault. If your mum or dad was an MP, things would be much better. You see, when it comes to their own children, MPs like to keep it all in the family. A whopping quarter of all MPs have employed a family member. Most recently, the Conservative Nadine Doris MP employed not one, but both of her daughters. 
They each received a salary of between 30 and 45,000 pounds a year. Not bad at all. But Mrs. Doris is not the only one. 155 other MPs have also given jobs to their family members, according to a body that oversees their salaries. You would have thought after fellow MP Derek Conway was forced to resign for allegedly employing two sons for non-existent jobs, they would have learnt. But the practice is still going strong, so if you're not lucky enough to be related to someone in the Mafia, try and get yourself adopted into the Westminster family. Join us next time as we go underground to bring you the latest beneath the mainstream from around the UK. Don't forget, you can drop us a line on Twitter at underground underscore RT, like our page on Facebook or email us goingunderground at rttv.co.uk. See you on Monday.